persons, and he's going to present a study which is long awaited, the, uh, the TASTE trial, tenecteplase versus alteplase for stroke thrombolysis. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. You stole my thunder. That was my line. But um, it's great, my great pleasure to announce the results of the test, TASTE trial on behalf of all of the TASTE investigators. The study was run across 35 uh, hospitals, eight countries, four continents, and was coordinated from uh, John Hunter Hospital in Newcastle. That's the warm Newcastle in Australia. Um, the, these are the authors that are on the paper. There's a bit longer than the 10 that are allowed for the abstract, but I wanted to include everybody. Um, and uh, our main funders were uh, NHMRC, which is Australian government grant. We had some additional funding towards the end of the study um, from Baringa Ingelheim, and as well as some study drug. Um, our declarations of interest are long, so I won't bore you with them. Uh, you can read them online. And I also won't bore you with um, the possible advantages of tenecteplase versus alteplase. You're probably getting a bit bored with that story, but as you know, tenecteplase is a, a, a closely related cousin of uh, alteplase with a couple of, it was three um, molecular mutations that potentially make it a more effective lytic for stroke, but certainly make it a more practical agent, as those of you who are still on the tools will know that you can give the, the bolus much more quickly and you don't muck around preparing an infusion. And we've shown in previous studies that that enables probably five or six minutes quicker um, treatment time. Um, and of course, um, we've been working on this agent in stroke for a very long time. And I think I treated the first patient with tenecteplase in our first study in about, back in about 2007. Um, and of course, many others have followed on. Um, and if you uh, note that there are a couple of uh, Norwegian trials using the higher dose, which are outlined in, in red, but if you look at the other studies, particularly the bottom three, um, ACT and TRACE2 are already published, phase three trials, non-inferiority trials, um, which um, showed non-inferiority of tenecteplase to alteplase in the four and a half hour window. A test two from my good friend Keith Muir, who hopefully we'll, I'll catch up with soon, um, has not yet been published, but it also showed a similar result. Um, and uh, I guess being Aussies and, and with our, 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 our broad-minded collaborators in many countries, we thought we were a bit different. In fact, we designed this study before the other studies, but took a bit longer to finish. Um, we're different to the, the other phase three trials in that we actually used perfusion imaging selection in all patients, um, which I think gives us a, a unique perspective on the, the tenecteplase data. And um, not only did we use perfusion imaging in all patients, we also used automated perfusion imaging to give us automated volumes and even the computer would tell you yes or no. Um, of course, uh, the computer's not always right, but neither are humans. And of course, we were, we're aiming for the reperfusion sweet spot, as we put it, and um, being from Australia and having UK sites, we could have put a cricket bat up there for hitting the sweet spot, but all of you know about the sweet spot in the golf club, so that's what we were aiming for. Um, um, just a brief overview of the study again, uh, pretty straightforward. It was any patient who was thrombolysis eligible within four and a half hours based on clinical criteria, but with additional multimodal CT criteria of, with a core of less than 70 mils. Sorry, the DWI snuck in there. We didn't have any MR sites for this study. Um, a core on CTP of less than 70 mils and a mismatch volume of more than 15 mils, a ratio of greater than 1.8 patients were randomised one to one to TPA or TNK at the 0.25 milligram per kilogram dose. And the primary outcome was ranking zero to one based on a non-inferiority probe design, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, the recruitment began way back in 2014 and um, we designed the study well before thrombectomy, the, thromb the, the raft of positive thrombectomy trials and well before it was implemented, but that obviously dramatically affected our study population um, and we, we've had a lot of ups and downs, including, I wouldn't say it's a down, but thrombectomy certainly affected our, our trial recruitment. Um, we also had COVID, and then we also had a, a prolonged period of, of no supply of tenecteplase, which was rather frustrating. So in 2017, in response to decreasing LVO recruitment, um, we changed from a superior to non-inferiority design because we felt we were unlikely to 
show superiority without the larger vessel occlusions, as we'd shown in our previous phase two trial where pre-thrombectomy. Um, and then in response to the Burger, Burgos SAVO meta-analysis and the effect size with tenecteplase in that um, meta-analysis, uh, we, we, we reduced our um, effect size to 8% and um, came up with a, for 90% power of 728 patients. But we had a pre-planned interim, which we got to in 2021 at 546 patients, and the final sample size was set at 832. I'll just dwell slightly on the non-inferiority primary analysis plan, which was pre-specified. We tested for non-inferiority on both intention to treat and per protocol, as recommended now by the European Medicines Agency and the FDA. Bit of controversy about that. Traditionally, it's done on per protocol only, but we followed the, the current recommendations. Um, we based our non-inferiority margin on the Embison 2014 Lancet meta-analysis of TPA versus uh, placebo. And you'll know that the other trials, for example, ACT came up with a different non-inferiority margin from the same data. And I won't debate that with you now. You can debate that with Professor Churilov and I afterwards. But we came up with a, quite a conservative non-inferiority margin of 0.03, which was half of the lower 95 CI limit uh, for a, a risk difference of um, 0.03, and we adjusted for age baseline NIHS and pre-morbid MRS. Um, we stopped in October 2023, and I might say that Beyonce has aged a lot better than Jay-Z, some might say that about others as well. Um, we stopped after the ATTEST-2 trial um, showed non-inferiority of tenecteplase as we felt that sites would consider it um, unethical to continue randomising, including the results from already published ACT2 and TRACE2. So we ended up with 680 participants, which was underpowered for the, the primary outcome based on our calculations. I'll just dwell slightly on the flow chart because it's important to understand how we got to the per protocol population. 680 randomised, uh, 339 to tenecteplase, 341 to, to alteplase. Um, and there are roughly about 10% protocol violations. Um, some of them were uh, inevitable leak towards thrombectomy. Um, so, so thrombectomy was an exclusion or a protocol violation, and particularly in one or two countries where um, the, the imaging was read in a delayed fashion by a radiologist or neuroradiologist, um, where then a decision after the patient was randomised to go to thrombectomy occurred. So there are about nine or eight in each group. And then with the, um, the, the imaging analysis um, for protocol violation, we had a a fantastic core imaging lab, which I'll talk about, thank at the end, um, which um, went through all of the imaging and looked for um, particular uh, imaging protocol violations, the most common of which were too small a perfusion lesion and also too much artefact. I'll show you some quick examples, um, but I won't go through them too much. And if you really want to know more about it, talk to one of our core imaging lab team, who you'll see at the end. Um, this was a patient who had too small a perfusion lesion after a removal of artefact. Um, this is a patient who's got um, very low flow in both in the bilateral white matter of each hemisphere causing artifactual um, core. Uh, there probably is a, a left posterior watershed lesion, but it's impossible to tell with all the artifacts, so they are excluded. This was a subacute infarct, which was quite interesting. So they fulfilled perfusion mismatch criteria, but um, you can see there was actually a subacute infarct that was missed, and there was actually some contrast enhancement in the subacute infarct which is scary, and indeed that patient actually had a symptomatic hemorrhage. So the baseline demographics, um, this is consistent with a um, MEVO or DEVO, so medium or distal vessel occlusion population with a median NIH stroke score of seven. For those of you who don't know what DEVO is, you'll need to Google it. You might get mixed up with a band from the 80s. Um, uh, the the, the, pop, the uh, proportion of patients across regions was, uh, there, were, there were more in Australia and New Zealand because there were more sites, but we also had Taiwan, um, yeah, mainland Europe, uh, England and Canada. I think our process times were quite good given that we didn't, were not allowed deferred consent as opposed to the Canadian study. Um, and the, the imaging again consisted with more, more distal occlusions, cores of about seven mils, per number of about 45 mils. Occlusion site spread from M1 um, right out to the distal MCA, PCA, ACA. Primary outcome, um, on intention to treat 57% um, to nectoplays achieved Rankin 0 to 1, 55% alteplase, that was a risk difference of 0.03. And if you look at the lower, lower confidence interval, minus 0.3, 
031, which um, missed by a mouse is whisker to prove not inferiority in the intention to treat. We've got another saying in Australia that's not uh, appropriate to mention now, but for per protocol, we comfortably achieved um, uh, non-inferiority with a risk difference of 0.05, um, and you can see the, the lower confidence interval minus 0.02. Just to show you the grotta bars, and I saw Jim come in earlier, um, the, the, in, the, the movement is in the, right, the correct direction for tenecteplase in both intention to treat and uh, uh, per protocol. But if you look at the right hand, there's a little hint towards increased mortality, which wasn't with tenecteplase, which wasn't significant. But just to show you that in more detail, 7% mortality at 90 days in tenecteplase, 4% in autoplase. Um, not, not statistically significant. There was, there was also a higher rate of severely disabling stroke or death in um, tenecteplase, but not significant, and symptomatic hemorrhage um, was slightly increased, but not significant with tenecteplase. These are some of the subgroups, which I won't bore you with too much, but just to draw your attention, we actually found um, um, superiority in the, in the more distal um, occlusion group as opposed to the, um, the LVO group. And I should mention there's still about a third of LVO or 30% LVO in this study. Um, and then when we finally added the results of TASTE with the red arrow to the, the meta-analysis, study level meta-analysis of all the published phase two and three trials, the overall result actually turns out to be superior of a risk ratio of 0.04. Um, and, and, and that translates in a number needed to treat of 25. So every 25 patients we treat with tenecteplase rather than alteplase, one more patient will have excellent recovery at three months. Um, so in summary, TASTE is the largest clinical trial ever to use perfusion imaging selection, let alone automated perfusion imaging volumetrics in all patients. It was the only trial that mandated, phase three trial that mandated inclusion of patients with a proven tissue target for reperfusion treatment which is the um, main advantage of CTP selection and a unique contribution of taste to the data. It removes the bias towards finding non-inferiority present in the prior trials that probably enrolled some stroke mimics and certainly enrolled patients without a target lesion or penumbra. So as such, taste increases our confidence that tenecteplase is at least non-inferior to alteplase for stroke lysis in the early time window. And note that's shown with our much smaller sample size and shows you the power of perfusion selection. And indeed, um, in the meta-analysis with taste resulted, we've now shown superiority of tenecteplase to alteplase. So I guess um, taste will continue to accelerate practice change and ongoing implementation of tenecteplase as the first choice thrombolytic for disabling ischemic stroke. We're impressed with Lancet Neurology. Fast Track didn't make it today, unfortunately, but it'll be online soon. I just wanted to briefly thank Professor Chung Shu, who was our lead investigator in Taiwan who passed away last year. He was a great advocate for many of our studies. Um, may he rest in peace. Yuan Shu Jiao Xiao An Xi, that means rest in peace in Chinese. And this is our team, KPI Chris Levi, who's been supported us all the way. Um, I can't mention everyone by name because I'm running out of time, but um, uh, Michelle Russell I need to mention is my work mother that keeps me in line most of the time. And, our, and I want to thank Bruce Campbell for bringing our New South Wales and Victorian teams together to, to make the best core imaging lab in the world now, and I say that unashamedly, and led behind the scenes by Gargan Sharma. There's some of our sites, and some of you might recognise yourselves. Um, I just wanted to thank my home team because the home team have probably been through as many ups and downs as Jay-Z and Beyonce, and I'm thankful that they've supported me the whole way. And my extended home team and family team now includes some of my close non-genetic brothers, uh, including Gargan Sharma, Henry Ma, Pradipta and Buren, who, who are, the, who are the, the brains behind our core lab. Um, thanks very much. And I just wanted to leave with a famous quote from a, an Australian Prime Minister who said, this is a victory for the true believers the people who, despite the most difficult times, have kept the faith. Thanks very much. God bless. Thank you.